Alessandra really built for herself an incredible knowledge of wines, more recently of beer and uh, sparkling waters, and that even more recently she has started doing pairings of food and wine, and that's her new specialty. She has a website called Wine Seduction, in which she explains to Americans that the relationship with wine must be built according to certain rules, like when you go on a date. And I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, Alessandra has worked as a sommelier in New York for several years now. Uh, for a while, she worked for a group of uh, high-end French restaurants. And she was recently acquired by St. Ambrose on Madison Avenue. And that's where you will find her. Um, I think it was very good that the Italians finally uh, called her back to her roots. And she's, so she's now working with an Italian wine list. But for a long time, she worked also with French wines that she knows very, very well. Um, what we asked Alessandra to, to do for us was a carrellata, really a, a, a fast and fun and uh, well-paced uh, walk through the history of wine, through the people that spoke about wine. And we decided that the material was so much that we would divide her talk into two parts. Today, Alessandra is going to talk from the origins, that is ancient Rome, to the Risorgimento, that for those of you who don't know, is the process of Italian unification that was completed in 1871. So I think Alessandra has a lot to do, and we are all here to listen to her. And then she also managed to get us a few bottles of Barolo from the Marchese di Barolo that we are going to taste at the end of the evening. So enjoy both Alessandra's talk and the tasting at the end. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Buonasera. OK, let's start this uh, journey. I'm, a, as Stefano said, I'm a sommelier. I'm a kind of unusual sommelier because any time that I talk, I describe a wine, I try to be, um, not to be snobby, because uh, when I started studying about wine, I realized that sommelier can be very, very boring. Anytime that you go to a restaurant and you ask for a bottle of wine, it seems that you are entering to Wikipedia, because sommelier want to give you too many information. So I decided to um, to describe and to study wine in a funnier way, in an entertaining way. And uh, because to me, wine is, uh, first of all, love and passion and history and culture. But it's not only me uh, that who believes that wine is uh, love and passion, because uh, let's start from the etymology of the word wine. Here it comes. Wine. Uh, that means vino in Italian, of course. And vino came from the Latin word vinum. But at the very, very beginning, we have to go back uh, to the 6,000 years before Christ in the area of uh, India and Asia from the Sanskrit. Because the word vinum that was used by the Latin came from the Sanskrit vena. And vena meant the juice coming from the, uh, the vine, so from the grapes, but also at the very same time, the word vena meant to love. So with the same word, we have two translations, wine and to love. That is amazing. So from the very beginning, wine meant to love in Sanskrit. And then we all know that the wine was originated, again, in the area of the Middle East. Let's say that the country where we have the first evidences of wine where, uh, was Georgia. Uh, Georgia, and then because of the uh, Greek, uh, the, the conquest by Greece, it came to, to Greece. And we have so many evidences from there. But before going to, to talk about the, the Greeks, what is the relation between wine and culture? Why are we uh, talking t 
tonight about the cultural history of wine. Well, because we are at Casa Italiana, and of course Italy has been always considered and is still now one of the wine country, maybe one of the best wine country ever. But Italy is also a country where the highest number of, for instance, UNESCO World Heritage Sites were born, we can say that the Italian peninsula, both the internal and external facets of the Western culture were born in Italy. And so the UNESCO World Heritage Sites from Italy are 49. And Italy is a home of over half of the world art treasures. So let's think about uh, people like Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Dante. All of them, all their art treasures are Italian. And what do these people have in common besides being uh, amazing artists? Well, they have in common something because they were wine lovers and so they dedicated uh, so many uh, lyrics that maybe they are not this famous but still uh, during this journey we will uh, know we will discover what Leonardo had to say about wine, what Dante had to say about wine. But let's start from the very beginning, because as I said, wine was born in Georgia. The first evidences of the first plants of wine were in Georgia over uh, something like 4,000 years ago, then Greece. And in Greece, we uh, meet Plato. Plato he was a philosopher. Um, he studied, his mentor was uh, Socrates. And uh, one of his favorite students, maybe uh, the best one, was Aristotle. Uh, Plato was also famous because he was the founder of the Academy of Athens. And we know that the Academy of Athens Athens was the first, uh, let's say, high school uh, institutions. And so uh, Plato said about wine, no thing more excellent, no more valuable than wine was ever granted mankind by God. So he was a, such an important philosopher, and he recognized that no more valuable thing then wine was given by God. So wine was uh, something that came from God. And then in this painting, uh, again, we have uh, such a beautiful painting by another great artist uh, that is uh, Raffaello Sanzio. From uh, Greece, we have to uh, move uh, to the Roman Empire. And so um, in Greece, they had the myth of God Dionysus, who was the god of wine. When uh, Romans uh, conquered the, the world, even they conquered also the Olympus. So they conquered also all the, the gods that were in Greece. And they, the Romans, nicknamed Dionysus Bacchus. And so from this moment on, we will hear about the Bacchanalia. Bacchanalia were parties, were no limits. So everything was allowed, there was no, no, no prohibition at all. They, the Romans during the Bacchanalia could drink whatever they want and could eat whatever they want. During the Bacchanalia, so Bacchus was the god of wine, and uh, according to the, um, to the legends, uh, there was the um, Bacchus had uh, a love affair with another goddess who was uh, Venus. And Venus uh, was the goddess of uh, love and beauty. And again, Venus, the etymology of Venus is the same of Venum. Again, another link, another connection between wine and love with the god of wine that was Bacchus. So one of the leading uh, lyric poets in, uh, in Rome, in the ancient Rome, is Horace, that, uh, whose name was, uh, the, the real name was Quintus Horatius Flaccus, who was born in Lucania in 65 before uh, Christ. So 
Horace uh, uh, gave us, uh, uh, consigned to posterity so many, I like to have this, okay, uh, signed to, consigned to posterity many quotes. Uh, one of them is, uh, the first one is, wine brings to light the hidden secrets of the soul, gives being to our hopes. And then something that is a little more, uh, something funny, that, uh, that is, I totally tr uh, believe that is true. No poems that are written by water drinkers can please for longer live. That is absolutely true. And then uh, let's stay in, uh, in Rome. And we have uh, other two uh, people. Uh, one is Ovid, uh, again, is a, a writer. Ovid, by the art of love, uh, he's younger compared to Horace. And he said, when there is plenty of wine, sorrow and worry take wing. So they fly away. Wine warms the blood, adds luster to the eyes, and wine and love have ever been allies. Again, once again, wine and love have ever been allies. And then there is the very famous one that I'm quite sure that many of you already know about in Vino Veritas, that in wine there is the truth, uh, by Pliny the Elder in the Naturalis Historia. But the one, maybe the one that very few people know, is the in Vino Sanitas. Oh my God, I'm moving this. <laughs> Uh, in vino sanitas, uh, so in wine there is also uh, the health. Here uh, is a um, kind of complicated uh, to discuss about uh, about this subject because you know we are all living in New York, we are all living in the U.S., and there is a different, let's say, um, mentality toward the wine. Here you know that if you are underage you cannot drink. But being myself Italian, being myself from Rome, but I was born from a family from um, who came from Tuscany. So I still remember that I had my first sip of wine when I was maybe um, eight years old and I had my first sip of grappa uh, when I was, again, eight years old, because my father was a winemaker. Even though I didn't enter into the wine business uh, at a young age, it was something that happened very recently, let's say 10 years ago. But again, we all know that in the old world, let's say Europe, for, for sure Italy and France, not only that, uh, people underage are allowed to drink, but there is also uh, doctors and scientists who truly believe and say that wine, in moderation, of course, that is a magic word, drink in moderation, but the wine can be healthy because of many antioxidants that are inside the wine, especially red wines, um, and also helps the blood circulation. And it was and Pliny, Pliny the Elder knew it, uh, even uh, many, many years ago. So uh, before going to this gentleman, uh, who I'm quite sure that you know about, Dante Alighieri, let's say that um, in between, uh, between the Roman Empire and Dante Alighieri, there is almost nothing. So with our journey is about artists or scientists or philosophers or politicians who had so much to say about wine. From the Roman Empire, from the decline of the Roman Empire until uh, Dante Alighieri, there is almost nothing. Uh, because wine was confined to the um, cultivation by the monks, like Benedictines or Cistercians. So wine was used only for liturgies, for religious liturgies during the Mass, blessing the wine and sharing the wine with the Holy Communion. But we have to think also that the Benedictines, uh, like St. Benedict, uh, was very important. They were very important because during these years they studied, they implemented so much the cultivation of uh, wine, and they discovered so many uh, techniques and uh, of wine cultivations and until and these uh, new techniques these new techniques were 
the same, remain the same until the 17th century. So for quite a long time, all the discoveries made by the monks remained exactly the same. Uh, during the 17th century and 18th century, we have such big discoveries. In the, um, and uh, let's say that uh, the era of the modern enology starts with the in introduction of the um, glasses, uh, uh, bottle of wine made in, uh, with glass, the corks, and even before by another uh, monk whose name was Don Perignon during the 17th century, uh, he discovered uh, the technique to make uh, bubbles, sparkling wine. And since he was from France, from a region of Champagne, he wrote the formula. He had the copyright to, to call that uh, technique the méthode champenoise, and etc., etc., etc. But let's go to Dante Alighieri. So Dante Alighieri, the sommo poeta, or oh, the poet. Dante Alighieri, Florence, 1265. Dante Alighieri is considered uh, the father, the first father of the Italian uh, language. He's very famous because he wrote the comedy. At first, the, the divine comedy was called just the comedy because divine arrived a few years later with uh, uh, Boccaccio, who considered this comedy so excellent, so inspired by God that was called divine. The divine comedy is an allegorical journey of the afterlife. It's uh, an idea of uh, a journey uh, of Dante uh, in company of another Roman poet, Virgil, through uh, Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso hell, purgatory, and heaven. But actually, is the journey that a human being uh, makes during his life toward God. And so with Dante, even Dante was a, a wine lover, because if we read the canto, there is a, just a, few, a short quote that to me is marvelous. The canto uh, 25th uh, from Purgatory, and I invite you also to read the Italian version because it's full of passion. E perché meno ammiri la parola, guarda il calor del sol che si fa vino, giunto all'amor che della vite cola. The translation is, uh, is not mine, it's the official translation. And that you may the less marvel at my words. Look at the sun's heat that becomes wine, when joined to the juice, that flows from the vine. So Dante is saying, don't be impressed by my poem, don't be impressed by my words, because there is something, there is something that is more and more important. The sun's heat that becomes wine, when joined to the juice that flows from the vine. And this is Dante Alighieri. So to me, this quote is amazing. And then another uh, distinguished um, VIP guest, who again we are in Tuscany, Leonardo da Vinci. Vinci is a town close to Florence, uh, so we jump to Renaissance two century more or less uh, after, right after uh, Dante Alighieri. So Leonardo da Vinci was Oh, wow, Leonardo da Vinci. Who was Leonardo da Vinci? Not a a multi-talented uh, artist. He was a painter, uh, sculptor, architect, engineer, mathematician, inventor, anatomist, geologist, cartographer, bot botanist, and writer, and astronomist. Okay. Leonardo is the, also, the, of course, the author of the very famous Mona Lisa, the enigmatic smile that, is, uh, that you can find at the Louvre uh, Museum in Paris. And also, he is the author of the La Supper, that is so, uh, of course, in these days of uh, Easter time, is, uh, you know that La Supper is the most reproduced religious painting in the world. And it's by Leonardo da Vinci. So this guy, this Leonardo was an artist, was a mathematician, an astronomist, an inventor, 
And he said that the discovery of a good wine is increasingly better for mankind than the discovery of a new star. So this is a Leonardo, it's not uh, whoever, it's Leonardo da Vinci. And then uh, since uh, he's, uh, he's from Tuscany, you know, I'm half a Tuscany too, and people from Tuscany, they have a, a great sense of humor. And so he said also with uh, the strong, uh, I, I, it seems to be, I, I hear his voice when reading, I imagine the, 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 his dialect and his strong Tuscany accent. E però credo che molta felicità sia agli uomini che nascono dove si trovano i buoni vini. I think that a great deal of happiness is given to men who were born and where good wines are grown. And I totally agree with him. <laughs> And then, again, from Tuscany, Michelangelo uh, Buonarroti. Uh, we are um, in Tuscany, but we are in Arezzo. Michelangelo Buonarroti, again, uh, uh, even for Michelangelo, we can say that he was a painter, sculptor, and, po uh, and poet. Um, very famous because of the Davide and uh, Pietà, the sculptures. And uh, Davide uh, and Pietà were built by Michelangelo um, when he was less than 30 years. So uh, he's a great artist. But here we are watching the Last Judgment that is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with Adam and the uh, omnipotent God and the very famous touch of their fingers. Well, uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti, I don't know uh, uh, if in the audience there are Italian people who have been living uh, recently in Italy. In Italy we had a, a TV commercial uh, a few years ago about uh, Martini and it said, no Martini, no party. And so here Michelangelo gave the first draft of the very same commercial, no wine, no feast, no party. I feast on wine and bread, and feast they are, simple like that. And then we have, again, we are still in Tuscany, but we change subject because we are about to uh, meet Galileo Galilei. So we moved from the art to the science. Galileo Galilei is the author of the theory of the heliocentrism. What is that? Um, the, the, it's not the, the sun spinning around the earth, but it's exactly the opposite. Earth and it's not the sun spinning, it's the earth spinning. Okay, so the sun is in the middle and all the others are going around. Okay, but also Galileo was a mathematician, so a scientist, uh, um, an astronomist, of course. He discovered also all the satellites of Jupiter. He discovered the, the, um, the phases of uh, Venus and he discovered uh, what else? the sunspots. So from this uh, guy, we, it, it, this is impressive uh, to me because I, I, when I think of Galileo, I think of someone who spent his entire life studying on numbers, on formula. And then he was able to write something, not only this quote, but the following one that by far is my favorite. But through this quote, we know also something very important. One is sunlight held together by water. There is something here that for, for many is obvious, but it's not this obvious. Wine is made with 85% of water. So, and uh, when, I, when I'm in the restaurant and people ask me about wine, I suggest wine, I do the wine pairing with food and et cetera, et cetera. Then if I have time to stay with those customers, we start a conversation. And trust me, when I ask, uh, do you know where, how, how the wine is made? Everybody uh, said alcohol, first alcohol, and then sugar. No, first is water, 85%. Then we have uh, uh, alcohol, uh, several kinds of alcohol. The most famous one, the most present in the wine is the ethylic. And then we have three acid, uh, tartarico, malico, uh, malic, and citric. Then we have uh, minerals. 
Then we have those antioxidants that I was mentioning before that are called the polyphenols and tannins. I, I know that so many times you heard talking about tannins, what tannins are. Are polyphenol substances that really contain the antioxidant of the wine. So, but everything was already known by Galileo. Sunlight held together by water. And here it comes the best from Galileo Galilei. Wine is the blood of the earth, the sun captured and transformed by such an artificial structure as the grape, a wonderful laboratory. So the grape is a wonderful laboratory to Galileo, where machinery, intelligence, and energy are put together by a perfect magician sorcerer. He's talking about God. Remember, this is a scientist who was studying about the universe, who was studying about the sun and the earth and Venus and Jupiter, the formulas, the scientific formula. But he recognized that behind all this science, there is a magician sorcerer. And also he had the passion to recognize that even a simple grape can be a perfect a wonderful laboratory where machinery, intelligence, and energy are put together by a perfect magician sorcerer. And the wine is transformed into a masterly compound of sap and light, thanks to which human inventiveness emerges distinctly and clearly. The soul expands, the spirit is comforted, and hilarity reigns supreme. That is wonderful. Okay, and then um, since uh, this journey is mainly uh, con talking about the contributions given by Italian artists, but it's not only Italian artists, especially in the following one, uh, the one that we will have uh, next week on April 23rd, we will have uh, also many contributions given by other artists coming from all around the world. But since we are all in New York City and uh, <laughs> United States, uh, and we are happily living here, and definitely I'm happily living here, and to this year, 2014, I can apply for the American citizenship. So I'm very happy about that. I want to give a tribute to uh, founding fathers of the nation, starting with uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was the first uh, father of the um, nation. Uh, he was born, as you said, uh, in, uh, in Boston. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was a, a leading author, a printer, a politician, scientist, mu musician, inventor, and a diplomat. He gave uh, uh, such a great contribution to studies of electricities, electricity because he discovered the, the lightning road and the bifocals. But he's considered the first father because because of his uh, indefatigable campaigning for colonial unit. And Benjamin Franklin was also the first US ambassador to France. So uh, he consigned uh, three quotes uh, to posterity about wine. There cannot be good living where there is not good drinking. And I agree with that. And then the second one, uh, wine makes daily living easier, less hurried, with fewer tensions and more tolerance. And it's true. And then we have another one that is very nice. That says, uh, uh, invite to think that the miracle of a conversion of water into wine happens every day. We hear of the conversion of water into wine at the marriage in Cana, as of a miracle. But this conversion is, through the goodness of God, made every day before our eyes. Behold the rain which descends from heaven upon our vineyards and which incorporates itself with the grapes to be changed into wine, a constant proof that God loves us and loves to see us happy. Benjamin Franklin. 
And then the other uh, founding father, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the principal author of the Declaration of the Independence in uh, 1776, and the third president of United States. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was born in Virginia. This is very important uh, for our uh, journey. He bought a property of uh, 5,000 acres at Monticello. His dream was to transform uh, that property into a big vineyard. He couldn't. But actually, uh, his dream was made true by an Italian, an Italian winemaker, an Italian wine family, Gianni Zonin, who recently, let's say 20 years ago, uh, the Zonin family bought this property in Barbrisville and transformed the whole mansion into an outstanding vineyard, cultivating Cabernet Franc and all the other varietal grape, but mostly Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. But also Thomas Jefferson is very important. Uh, first of all, he spoke five languages, so he was a multi-talented, and not only politician, but he was... He, had so many interested, and one of them was agriculture. Because of Thomas Jefferson, even the tomato was uh, started having a good reputation, because um, maybe you don't know, but tomato had a very bad reputation until Thomas uh, Jefferson because a uh, tomato was considered poisoning, a poisoning fruit, actually because of the high acidity, and also because the tomato has the characteristic of being uh, like a, uh, a sponge, una, una, una spugna, a sponge, and so since in Europe, well, tomato came from the Central America, by the Aztecs uh, and the Maya uh, civilization. Th because of the discovery of America was brought to Europe. In Europe, tomato was served into the tables of aristocratic people. But since the dishes that were used were made with poetry, peltro, pewter, so the tomato absorbed all the pewter and became poisoning. And so many people, many aristocrats, died right after eating the tomato. But wasn't the tomato, was the, 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 the pewter uh, dishes that were using. So Thomas Jefferson realized that the tomato wasn't poisoning and started cultivating at Monticello tomatoes and tomatoes. And uh, he uh, decided to, to make this public. He, along with uh, his entire family, uh, asked all the media of those times to take pictures, to write about tomato, to write recipes on tomato. But again, he was a wine lover. In this letter that he was uh, writing uh, at the beginning of um, uh, 19th century, in uh, 1814, to one of his wine and food provider, Thomas Appleton, uh, he described what he considered necessities of life. So um, something that absolutely he wanted to have during the day. One of them is the wine. The other were hair powder, salt, olive oil, and wine, of course, and books. And so by this letter, first of all, we know that uh, Thomas Jefferson loved the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, because he, he said, for the present, I confine myself to a physical want of some good Montepulciano. And your friendship has uh, heretofore supplied me with that which was so good that I naturally address my want to you. Perhaps I may trouble you annually to about the same amount, this being a very favorite wine and habit having rendered the light and high flavored wines an accessory of life with me. It's not a mistake. In those years, instead of saying necessity, was a necessary of life. So you will find in all the, in all the Google necessary instead of necessity. And uh, 
Uh, what else? Uh, we are in the moment of um, where the United States were living, uh, the moment of the self-interest. That means that uh, Americans were trying to use their domestic good products instead of importing uh, from uh, abroad. But at the very same time, uh, Thomas Jefferson considered uh, that wine was absolutely mandatory, like a necessity of life. And so he said, I think it's a great error to consider a heavy tax on wines as a tax on luxury. On the contrary, it is a tax on the health of our citizens. And then here he comes the last one, where we can appreciate uh, really uh, Thomas Jefferson as someone so devoted to agriculture. Cultivators of the earth are the most virtuous and independent citizens. Let's go back to Italy and let me introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Carlo Goldoni. Carlo Goldoni is the most famous Italian playwright and librettist. Uh, he was born in the Republic of Venice. Uh, we are in the same time of uh, Benjamin Franklin, one year after. Carlo Goldoni is the author of so many comedy uh, that are still played uh, nowadays in all the theater, for sure in the Italian theaters, but also in the international theater. Uh, like uh, Arlequin, uh, the servant of two masters, and also La Locandiera, that can be translated like the innkeeper. So Carlo Goldoni writes uh, something uh, very funny, and uh, Carlo Goldoni compares wine, again, to love, because according to him, both love and wine restore our soul. And here we have Viva Bacco e Viva More. L'uno e l'altro ci consola. Uno passa per la gola, l'altro va dagli occhi al cuore. Bevo il vinco, gli occhi poi, faccio quel che fate voi. That is Viva Bacchus and Love Alive. The one and the other restore us. One passes by the throat, the other goes from the eyes to the heart. I drink wine with my eyes, then I do what you do. Then, let's turn serious. <coughs> Giacomo Leopardi. <coughs> Giacomo Leopardi, for those who are uh, in love with Italian literature, the Italian poets, well, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, skip uh, Giacomo Leopardi. Giacomo Leopardi, for those who have studied in Italy, uh, we all know that we spend uh, in the high school uh, like uh, four to six months uh, studying uh, Leopardi, all the, his uh, poems like The Infinitive, like uh, To Silvia or The Broom, La Ginestra. Uh, he was born in the Marche region, uh, Recanati, 1798. But Leopardi, who uh, died very young, uh, he was 39 years old uh, when he passed away because uh, Giacomo Leopardi had so many uh, problems, healthy problems, many sickness. And so maybe this suffering, so he was suffering, and so maybe this was also the, uh, the reason why he uh, devoted, he gave his soul to the poetry and uh, so poems by Giacomo Leopardi are really full of feelings and uh, uh, very strong emotion. But he was the author also of uh, a collection, a variegated collection of uh, thoughts uh, called the Zibaldone. So it's something more mm, enjoyable. From the Zibaldone, we uh, know that uh, wine uh, to Giacomo Leopardi was very useful for rejuvenation and vitality. It was, uh, uh, had the power of healing the body and the spirit, and also had the power to inspire the poetry. And um, it was considered like an elixir for transcendence. And so, 
he said the wine is the pleasure. The pleasure of wine is a mixture of the corporeal and spiritual. It is not simply corporeal, rather it consists mainly of the spirit. The wine is the surest and without comparison, the most effective comforter. Remember that he was very sick and hence the vigor, hence the nature. Ladies and gentlemen, Alessandro Manzoni. Uh, Alessandro Manzoni, if the Italian students spent four to six months with Giacomo Leopardi, the other four to six months they spent with uh, Alessandro Manzoni from uh, Milano. And he had uh, such a long life uh, because, yes, he uh, was uh, about 90 years old when he passed away, right after the unification of Italy. This is very important because Alessandro Manzoni <coughs> is considered, along with Dante, remember I said the first uh, father of the Italian language, but Dante was born in, uh, in 1265 uh, or 95. Here we are a little, uh, a few years uh, later, and with Alessandro Manzoni, we can consider the Italian um, used by Alessandro Manzoni as the modern uh, Italia, Italian language. He wrote, uh, comes from Milano, uh, <clears throat> is considered also one of the father of Italy. Uh, because uh, this uh, novel, I Promessi Sposi, The Betrothed, um, is full of patriotic messages because Italy didn't exist. Italy was split in so many um, different regions, all of them ruled by a foreign government. We had in the northwest uh, the kingdom of Sardinia, uh, Sardinia Piemonte, ruled by the Savoy family. Then we had, uh, we had the Lombardia, where Alessandro Manzoni was, that, where there were the Austrian, and then so many others. In, the, in Rome, in the center of Italy, there was the Vatican, another state, another country. And then we had the Asburg in Tuscany, and then the south of Italy, the kingdom of the two Sicily with the Bourbons. So Alessandro Manzoni was not only a writer, a poet, but he tried to give his contribution uh, also as a writer to the uh, unification of Italy. And Promessi Sposi can be considered a masterpiece also from this point of view. The story is very nice and let's say simple because it's the about a wedding, an impossible uh, wedding of two uh, young people, uh, Renzo and Lucia, uh, Renzo of course the, uh, the groom and uh, Lucia the, the bride. Since one of the aristocrats uh, who was uh, at that time uh, was in love with, uh, was falling in love with uh, Lucia, he didn't want to, he didn't want Lucia to get married with uh, Renzo and so uh, there are so many episodes but at the end Lucia was kidnapped and imprisoned into a castle, uh, the castle of the nominato unnamed. And uh, <clears throat> during the, um, those days where Lucia was there, uh, there was a guardian, a guardian who, a lady, who was trying to feed Lucia, but Lucia didn't want to eat everything, anything. So the guardian grabbed with her right and wrinkled hand a fiasco. You know what fiasco is, right? That was on the table with her left hand a glass. And after a first sudden tinkle of the glasses, lifted up the bottle, tipped it, it over the cup, filled it, laid it to her mouth, drank a sip, withdrew the glass, knocked two or three times a lip against the other, like this, mm, like doing this when you like something, right? And exclaimed, ah, this wine would even have the power to raise the death. Oh, beautiful happiness is to have a good fiasco. Go to hell worries and thoughts. I do not regret anything, nor to get old. But if I were young, gosh, I would enjoy it as much as I want. 
from Alessandro Manzoni. And again, it's beautiful. This is the translation in English. It was a little longer to also uh, include the, the Italian version. But again, Alessandro Manzoni can be considered truly the father of Italian language because before uh, releasing the Promessi Sposi to the market, we all know that Manzoni, according to the gossips of those time, went to Florence from Milano in order to, how can we translate a Shaquari Panninarno? Rains his, cl his clothes into the uh, Arno River, kind of make a laundry of his uh, Milanese dialect in order to uh, to publish this book in the official Italian language that cons was considered the, the language spoken in Florence. And then, uh, what else? Uh, and yes, then we have, uh, we are about uh, to, uh, this is the last character of this journey. And uh, this guy is called Camillo Benzo, Conte di Cavo, such a big <laughs> name, first and last name, uh, Count of Cavour. He was our first prime minister of the newborn kingdom of Italy. Again, we are in the same years of Alessandro Manzoni, same situation. Italy was created in, uh, in on March 17 of uh, 1861. So we celebrated uh, on 2011, 150 years, the 150th anniversary of the foundation of Italy. Italy seems to be a very old country, it's not. Has been unified only in 1861. Has been unified because of the actions of many, many, many people who gave their life uh, three words of independence and many people who were behind this unification. But again, we can say that we have two founding fathers that are very important for our purpose to know uh, a different aspect of wine because our two first founding fathers were also two great wine lovers. So this guy was not only the one who signed for the, for the birth of Italy, but he was also the inventor of Barolo wine, exactly the wine that we will taste in a few minutes. What happened? Uh, before being a prime minister of the kingdom of Italy, uh, Cavour, was, uh, was the mayor of Grinzane, that was his uh, hometown. We are in Piemonte, in the northwest uh, of Italy, where before the kingdom of Italy, there was the kingdom of Sardinia, Piemonte, ruled by Savoy family. This Savoy family became the kings also of Italy, of the newborn. And the first capital of Italy was in Torino, still in Piemonte. Barolo is not only the name of the wine, but before having the Barolo wine, we had just the town of Barolo. What happened? Uh, Cavour realized that uh, they didn't have, even though Piemonte is a very famous wine region, there was no wine to be served during the diplomatic meeting. These people spent every day, every morning, every night in meeting, in doing diplomatic meetings with ambassadors, with consulars, with prime ministers of other countries in order to make Italy, to create Italy. And so we realized that they didn't have any wine to serve during those meetings. And the only wine available was, in order to have a good and prestigious wine, the only wine available came, uh, came from France, from Bordeaux and Burgundy, that is right in the border with uh, with uh, Piemonte. So I say, it cannot be true. We have so many indigenous varietal grape. Let's use our indigenous varietal grape and let's make 
a wine, a prestigious wine, a wine that can be so powerful to be served in the table where kings are sitting. And this is the reason why Barolo was named the king of wines and the wine for kings. Even now, even in a restaurant, uh, especially for those who are more into the wine culture, when they ask for a Barolo, they know that they are asking for the king of wines and the wine for the king. So Cavour was very uh, close friend to this uh, uh, beautiful lady. Uh, aristocratic French lady called uh, Juliette Colbert de Montlevrier, who uh, was uh, from France, of course, and uh, uh, along with uh, a winemaker from France, again, Comte uh, Louis Houdard, they sat at the table and said, okay, let's make a wine. They tried using the Nebbiolo grape, that is the indigenous varietal grape from Piemonte that is still used for making uh, Barolo, but also Barbaresco, but also Gattinara, and Gemme, so many others wine. But the wine that was uh, available in those days was a Nebbiolo medium dry that was absolutely disgusting. And um, also going on the sweet notes, and also it was a, an easy wine that wasn't able to be transported. And that was a, such a big problem because they didn't have any cars, they didn't have any uh, airplane, and so they, could, they had to use carriages to transport. But that Nebbiolo was so... Um, weak that couldn't uh, last for more than one day. And so they wanted to create this uh, wine. The three of them made it, made the dream come true. And the first production of Barolo, made by Juliet Colbert, uh, Camillo Benzo Conte di Cavour, and Louise Audard, was given as a gift to the king Carlo Alberto, Charles Albert, the first king. He was uh, so impressed by this powerful uh, red, finally they had an important wine. And so the gift was given in 30 barrels, that uh, those barrels were called the Carra. And Carra because they were perfect to be transported into carriages, carrozze. Because of the word of mouth, all the other uh, aristocratic people, the ambassadors, knew that uh, finally there was an outstanding and amazing uh, red wine. And they asked uh, the Juliette Colbert, I want to have some, please give me some. And so they started their production. Along with, in the very same moment, Juliette Gol Colbert got married with the Marquis of Barolo. Remember, I told you Barolo is also the name of a town. So, uh, well, yeah. And uh, uh, with uh, uh, Tancredi Falletti, who was the Marchese de, uh, Marquis of Barolo. So they moved to the castle of Barolo, where all the vineyards were planted, while in Torino uh, there was the uh, aging process of the, of the wine. Unfortunately, uh, the family came to an end to, in uh, 1864 when Juliette Colbert uh, Falletti passed away. They didn't have any children, any heirs. And so the Marchese di Barolo uh, passed to a, a charitable foundation, a foundation called uh, Opera Pia. In those uh, time, in that time, Pietro Abona was born and he started working into a wine cellar. In 1895, he was able to buy the whole Marchese di Barolo. And right now, the Marchese di Barolo property, cellars and vineyards are owned by the same Abona family. And the family who gave us tonight the Barolo that we will taste are Anna ed Ernesto Abona, the fifth generation 
of uh, Pietro Abona that can be considered the natural hair of the, of the Barolo. Uh, let me give you also some technical notes about the Barolo that we will taste thanks to the generosity of uh, Marchesi di, di Barolo. Barolo is made, uh, again, with a Nebbiolo grape, uh, cannot be released to commerce before three years. Tonight we will taste the 2008. Anytime that you have a Nebbiolo in your glass, even if you are not a wine expert, you can recognize easily that is a Nebbiolo, can be a Barolo, Barbaresco again, by the color, because the color is always garnet, is never deep ruby red. So if you want to impress your friends, and uh, if you see in your glass something that is thick, very dark in the color, for sure cannot be a Barolo, cannot be anything made with a Nebbiolo grape, because the color is always garnet. In this case, in the 2008, we'll still have some ruby red hues and highlights, but after a long aging process, you will lose all the ruby red highlights to go more on the orange notes. What well, is characteristic of a Barolo from the uh, uh, flavors point of view are uh, roses, bush, and tar, and uh, cinnamon, and also leather, especially when the wine is absolutely, mm, let's say, it's not old because the wine is not, it's like a human being. Wine is never old, can be aged. And I used to say, <laughs> and this is a, one of the things that I uh, teach uh, during the wine seduction uh, seminars. It's a, a different approach to wine and comparing wine to human beings and comparing, again, the tasting of a wine to the steps of, uh, of a date. This wine has spent uh, uh, two years in Barrique. You heard so many times the sommelier saying, oh, he spent two years in Barrique. What does it mean? It means that this wine, before being released, uh, the winemaker decided to let him rest in order to have more uh, complexity. Because in the barrel, uh, what happens is a reaction between uh, the oak containing the, the barrel and the liquid that is inside. When I say this wine tasted like uh, cinnamon, it doesn't mean that someone added uh, some cinnamon, but it's the combination, the contact between the wine and the oak uh, that creates this uh, flavor. This is the reason why it's very, very important the use of what kind of oak is used. In this case, has been used French oak and Slavonian that, it, that are the, the best. And what else? I think that is, um, that's all. And the only thing that I can say is thank you for coming with this awful weather. And uh, I invite you to come uh, next week, uh, April 23rd, because we will start from uh, actually from here. This is the for next week. Again, a culture, cultural history of wine from the birth of Italy. So from the very same moment, we knew Camillo Benso Conte di Cavour, who was the inventor of Barolo. We will start with the second founding father, the second prime minister of Italy, who was uh, the Barone, Baron Bettino Ricasoli from Tuscany, who, beside being the, our second prime minister, was also the inventor of Chianti wine. The one, but here is different because he wrote the formula. While Cavour sat at the table, they made uh, several um, trying to, to make the wine. Uh, Ricasoli wrote the formula, and that formula remained the same until 2006. Absolutely the same. It was changed, it was changed a few years ago. And then from Bettino Ricasoli, so we are still in 1871, uh, we will move to uh, other uh, artists, uh, and we will not stay only in Italy. We will know what Pablo Neruda had to say about wine, Salvador Dalí, 
And then uh, who else? Uh, then we will have, uh, well, in Italy, Josue Carducci, Giovanni Pascoli, and then uh, a wine that to me was the, fa uh, the first phase book. And then we will have a great conclusion with uh, a very VIP <laughs> guest, uh, the Holy Pope, <laughs> Pope Francesco, who is amazing because uh, during uh, one of his homily, he said something amazing about wine. So I invite you all to come next week and to have a glass of wine a Barolo by Marchese di Barolo. Thank you, Stefano Albertini, for inviting me. And thank you so much. It was a great, great pleasure. <laughs> yeah. I thank Alessandra for having uh, taken us through this fun uh, journey through wine. And would you take a couple of questions? I have one, Alessandra. Um, when people who know things about wine drink it, uh, they do strange movements with their glass, <laughs> they do strange noises with their mouth, with their nose. Uh, we are, we, unfortunately, we don't have a set of beautiful glass wines that we would need to offer you the Barolo in a proper way so that it can breathe and all that. But uh, what should we do when we taste wine at the restaurant, at least to impress our date? <laughs> yep. Okay, is uh, when the sommelier or everybody uh, swirl the glass is not only a habit, actually it's also a habit because right now, uh, since I, I work as a sommelier, but I swirl even the cup of coffee, the, the <laughs> yeah, whatever. And any time that I drink, whatever I drink, I do like this, like this. This is very important for wine. It's not you don't don't do this with coffee, with orange juice, with water because it doesn't make any sense. But trust me, all the sommelier, everybody, all the sommelier that I know, we have exactly the same habit. So, first of all, pour the wine a very small quantity into the glass. Uh, when the wine is poured into a glass, let's say that in that moment it's kind of a violence for the wine because it's entering into something new. So it needs to, that need, needs to be done very slowly and little by little. So the wine into the glass will have the time to feel itself comfortable in the new recipient that is the, the glass. And then you start swirling because you have, because it's very important, the contact with the oxygen. You are starting a chemical reaction. Without being too complicated, it's like uh, uh, when you shake hands with someone. You are starting something. That is a chemical reaction, actually, because you feel the other hand it can be wet, can be dry, can be warm, can be cold. It happens exactly the same with the wine, but everything is because of the oxygen. Without the oxygen, you cannot smell anything, you cannot taste anything. When you are very cold, you don't uh, appreciate anything. So by doing that, it's very important the surface of the glasses, because the bigger, the better, because it enters more oxygen. By the reaction with oxygen, all the aromas will be released. And so by that, this, and this is also why, instead of drinking, you have to savor it little by little, because, and any wine is different, a, a minute after the other minute, because more oxygen. Uh, and so the wine turns into a completely different wine from uh, uh, an hour to another hour. And this is very recommended to do that, not only to impress your friends, but also when we have important wine, because they need to breathe. Another example, um, when we are in, um, in our uh, living room, in our bedroom, when you open a drawer, the smaller, the more intense are all the, 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 the smell coming from the drawer, right? And this happens also to wine. So this is also the importance of the barrel, because the bigger, the less contribution will be given by the oak. But the smaller, like the barrique, who are 225 liters, 
the, the, the bigger will be also the contribution given by the oak. So you need to aerate your uh, t-shirts anytime that you open a drawer, exactly the same happens when you are pouring the wine. You need to aerate the, the wine. And then when you have a sip, it's very important that again, this situation of the oxygen happens to your mouth because your mouth is another laboratory where something will will happen so you need to do like this entering the oxygen uh, it's very the oxygen is entering through the your your teeth and then you can if you stay without swallowing it right away if you stay with the wine in your palate you can appreciate uh, the taste of the wine. Remember that at the tip of our tongue, we can appreciate uh, the sweetness. Well, here we have the acidity. On the back of our tongue, we can uh, taste uh, the bitterness. So all of them are very important. So if you swallow uh, without uh, uh, staying for two seconds, you cannot, you do not have this moment of tasting but if you maintain your liquid whatever it is in your mouth you can feel is it acid um, and then we have also the, con the contribution given by the saliva so we need a little time to to do uh, that and then again by the swirling also uh, you can appreciate the color because the color gives you so many information about the wine the age of the wine the varietal grape and uh, the consistency of the wine the, the structure of the wine because if the wine is very let's say mm, easy and mm, not full body not too powerful even when you swirl it's like swirling water other wines that seems to be made with olive oil because it's like they stuck into the glass and they start crying and those are called the tears of the wine in Italy and in Europe, while here in US they are called the legs of the wine. That is more seductive also. <laughs> and again, this is wine seduction. And uh, what else? No, you gave a perfect answer. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, this is very important. Don't, you can hold the glass with your palm of the hand only when the temperature is wrong. If the wine is too cold, you can warm it up uh, using the palm of your hand. Otherwise, all the time use the stem in order not to interfere with the temperature of the wine. And again, I know that is another habit to drink white wines very cold. The colder is the wine, the less you will appreciate. Because it's like when you put food in your refrigerator, uh, refrigerator, no aromas at all. It doesn't taste anything. So you have to wait for the right temperature. And again, also to put ice on the red wines is like killing that wine. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, if you come to the restaurant to San Ambrose and if you ask me to have uh, ice in the red wine I will give you two or three ice cubes I promise <laughs> any other question yes there is one there Okay, first, first of all, first of, before opening, remember that in order to uh, perfectly store a bottle of wine, never vertical, always like this, uh, laying position. Because by laying, uh, the wine will rest, and also there will be uh, communication between the wine and the cork. Because if the cork uh, turns too dry, well, most likely that wine will be corky. 
You, you know, the when you open a bottle of wine and you feel uh, like those uh, awful aroma of uh, raining, uh, of uh, dirty shoes and dirty socks, <laughs> that is quirky. So if you don't store the wine in this laying position, it may happen. A bottle of wine, a red wine that has been uh, already opened, first of all, try to drink it. Now, <laughs> that is very important because, but if the wine is, uh, again, it has a great complexity, you can store it for mm, two, three days. Uh, you can also pour it into a decanter. When the wine is uh, an aged wine, it will help a lot. The decanter is the big bottle uh, with a big belly, the one made uh, like this. And you have to pour it in order to, again, create more oxygenation, more aeration. And then my suggestion, let's say that many put in the refrigerator. I personally prefer to store it in a dark place, far from any light and for, uh, from any heating. Uh, what uh, is absolutely um, uh, dangerous for wine is the change uh, of temperature. While is absolutely uh, incredible positive, um, for the wine, for the wine making, when the temperature between uh, uh, the excursus thermico, uh, temperature from morning to night, change into a vineyard, that is a very good for having a great wine. It's very important that the vineyards are under the sun with a very warm temperature during sunlight and very cold temperature during night. This is the reason why many outstanding wines come from cold regions, like Barolo that comes from Piemonte. For the bottles of wine already opened, please uh, put them in a dark place, laying position. When it's opened, to me, better not into the refrigerator, better into a dark room. Room temperature, to me, is fine. Any other question? Oh, wow, two. <laughs> okay, ah, this is, <laughs> okay. So many times uh, I'm asked to serve a wine without sulfates. There is no wine without sulfates. Uh, it's uh, something different. But all the wines that are in the market have sulfates. Can have more or less, but definitely they do have it, them. So it's not when they say, oh, it doesn't have any sulfates, they are lying. Because if you don't uh, use sulfates, you don't have a wine. You have something different. You have grape juice. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, what is the, the, the whole story is that, uh, for instance, uh, French uh, use more sulfites than uh, Italian. Every country is different. So um, when they say it doesn't have, it means that it has very low, but still has some. But it's a chemical? Si. Yep, is in order to um, make the wine last, because otherwise it will be. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're welcome. The general advice is drink Italian wines instead of French wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You say so, <laughs> but I totally agree. Now, again, for instance, in Italy, it is forbidden to irrigate uh, the vineyards, while in France they can do that. So every country has a different uh, regulations. But why in Italy is forbidden? Because they, we want to have a, a wine that is made by nature, by can be a, an outstanding vintage, or unfortunately, we have to skip one year and wait for the following one. Because uh, if it's not to, uh, if, it, if it didn't rain during summertime, well, the winemaker knows what to do. Uh, so there are so many tricks that can be done, but definitely the irrigation is not allowed in Italy. We have one last question. Well, we have time for our. 
Brindisi. 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 Li biamo, li biamo. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Thank you.